Well, thank you for coming to the session. Um, well, I just want to say that this is a, a joint work with two of my colleagues, Finn Tarp and Larry Rook from the Oxford University. And the second announcement is that this, the work we are presenting today is, is just work in progress. So we are using the latest um, uh, wheat uh, data that uh, we got a few weeks ago. So. Uh, this is very much the first results, and uh, by any chance, by any means, are conclusive. But uh, we want to present what we are finding, which is surprising. But um, um, nevertheless, it's something interesting. Well, um, of, of course, um, one of the, the the questions that we were asking when we were thinking of writing this paper is um, was um, within the discussions um, on inequality, the importance of inequality. And a number of things. Obviously, the connection between inequality and growth is well established. And, uh, but there are other factors as well that inequality can negatively affect in terms of consumer demand, national savings, human capital formation, and so forth. Uh, at the same time, inequality um, has other pervasive effects on social cohesion and crime, uh, conflict, corruption, governance, and other aspects that have been covered by other uh, scholars, but um, within the UN, um, there have been a lot of discussions, and um, one of the most recent reports um, for the preparation of the discussion on the post-2015 uh, development agenda, they actually stress the importance of inequality. Uh, one of the, they say one of the key challenges for, for the future is actually inequality. So um, obviously it's very important to understand what is happening within countries, but also globally. And, uh, and also to, uh, to identify the trends, the directions of this, is, is, is has become um, a very contested issue, the l perhaps one of the last most authoritative reviews on this issue, so global inequality, says that uh, it is not possible to reach a de definitive conclusion regarding the direction of change in global inequality. So this is a very clear statement about how we are right now. and. Uh, this was one of the motivations that we have to write this paper. So when we start to look at other, other work, of course there are a number of studies looking at trends or within country inequalities. Uh, the work done by Andrea uh, has been influential. And of course other studies have been looking at between country inequalities. So how different countries diverge or converge over time. Uh, perhaps a few studies have been measuring global inter interpersonal inequality while decomposing the within and between components. And uh, uh, well a, a, a documented or um, known studies by Salem Martin, by Francois Bourguignon and others, they have been uh, suggesting different approaches to measure global inequality. Um, in when uh, we were deciding the ways we want to measure, of course, um, we came across a few measures and uh, uh, we were exploring, uh, we decided to use the TL because, as you know, it's uh, the, the measure uh, that can be decomposable and, um, and this is what we are using. We are using as well genius, but then, of course, um, the mean law deviations is the measurement that we are using for measuring inter uh, personal global inequality. So, um, well, um, just to give you um, the main findings that we have, which is closely related to Rahul's findings as well, is that, um, well, overall we find that change in inequality um, over time, and in particular in China and India, have been um, pushing down the global inequality estimates, in particular because um, from 75 to 2005, you saw a reduction in between uh, country uh, inequality, simply because China and India were growing faster than, than developed countries. So, of course, the gap between these countries were narrowing. But uh, um, when we started to work on the latest version of the grid, uh, we saw something interesting uh, coming out from the data. It's something that we want to show you. And we are not quite sure what is behind that. So, so after the, the crisis of 2008, uh, we observed a fall in inequality globally, but particularly in countries like China and other countries that have even further reduced um, uh, trends in global inequality. 
So, um, so just just briefly to tell you what we did is, um, of course, we use the conventional Gini that, as you know, measures the cumulative share of income uh, relative to the cumulative population share. So. Um, the problem, as you know, with the gene is that it's not decomposable, and that's why we are using the mean law deviations to get the between and within country components. So, um, how to uh, how we are defining global interpersonal inequalities is very is actually very simple. We, uh, for example, if you assume that y CQT is the average per capita income in quintile Q of country C in year T, then we can actually get a domestic inequality in a given country year, which is estimated on the assumption that all the individuals in the same quintile have the average per capita income for that particular country year quintile. So it's a very uh, strong assumption, and we will discuss, uh, I will tell you a bit what we are trying to do. Um, but of course, uh, once we do that, um, the world distribution of income in year T can be constructed by compiling all the available country quintile data in year T. So, so once we weighted this by population, we get an estimate of the global interpersonal inequality. So, of course, as you may be thinking, may, I suppose, is we are making a very simplifying assumption because we are putting together um, all the individuals <coughs> in every quintile and we are giving them the same income. Um, we are not the only ones who have adopted that approach. Um, there are other studies that have um, adopted the same approach, all, with a few exceptions. They are trying to construct some smooth um, distributions uh, within the country components. And uh, we assume that our estimates are perhaps biased uh, downwards. Uh, this is uh, perhaps a conservative estimate of the global interpersonal distribution. But nevertheless, as a robustness check, we are as well um, computing the Sherox and one algorithm that actually help us to smooth the distribution and this is what Sally and Martin have done um, previously. So we are doing it so uh, the, the, uh, the smoothing um, exercise just uh, as, a, as a comparability exercise. At the same time we constructed a few counterfactual scenarios. The first one was uh, we consider the situation in which India and China's income per capita and distributions of income uh, have remained unchanged let's assume between this period and uh, keeping the population uh, growing at the same rate as they did. The same, the second um, contra, um, contrafactual scenario was assuming that China and India had been able to grow their incomes at uh, the same rate as they actually did, but they managed to keep the inequality as they observed it back in the 75. So Again, these are counterfactual scenarios that we wanted to see what was the effect of those big countries across the global interpersonal inequality. Right, so as I said, we are using the GUI, the, la the last version, um, um, and then, uh, of course, we, uh, we did some um, adjustments uh, because, of course, there is, um, it is unclear and it is still um, uh, can be a source of, of, of uh, debate about whether to use income or consumption. Um, and um, I think what we did was um, we uh, follow a Denner and Squire approach of, um, in a way, identifying the, uh, the deviation of the, of the units based on expenditure in relation to incomes, and we just awaited and adjusted those gaps um, to bring all the genies to income inequality. Right? So the correlations are, um, as you may expect, relatively um, closer, but they are not perfect, and that really depends at, at, at the point at which you are in the distribution. And for the number of individuals per country quintile, um, we use um, different sources of, uh, for the population, um, the United Nations Population Division, uh, the Eurostat, um, the U.S. Census Bureau, and so forth. And for income levels per capita per country quintile, we use GDP per capita just for purchasing power parity from the World Bank. The reason is because in the WID we don't have um, mean incomes for all the countries across time. So it's, uh, that was one of the the the, the, uh, the limitation that we have in the data. So we decided, as imperfect as can be, use GDP per capita. Right, so um, just the, uh, to give you the results. Um, 
Well, uh, w the paper that is available, we have done this until 2005. So you can go and take a look. And uh, we were um, explaining what we think is behind the, the default in global in interpersonal inequality, primarily driven by a, uh, a very strong force from between country inequalities. And, um, but then, <laughs> when we estimated uh, the last um, data, um, Finn and, and Larry were pondering what, that, what was happening. Um, because um, not only the between country inequality was falling, but also the within country component was falling. Um, so we were not expecting that. So um, um, as you can see, uh, the, 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 the change is, is significant. So we are trying to figure out what are actually, what is driving this, this fall in, in within country inequalities. So we will give you some potential ideas about, or some or possibilities or clues about what is behind this decline in, in within, con in between country, uh, within country inequalities. Um, um, right, so if we look at regional inequality, um, we observe a considerable variation um, across countries, um, whereas Latin America, East Asia, and South Asia observe a decline in inequality recently. Uh, we observe an increase in inequality in Northern, North America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and as you can see, uh, the trends are um, no homogeneous at all. So then when we look at the between country component, then it seems like to be more, um, the, the trajectories are more homogeneous and all the regions consistently have observed in different degrees a decline in between country inequalities within these regions. So um, we also um, observe some obviously strong negative correlations between GDP per capita and genius, as you may expect. And uh, although we find a modest positive correlation between the increase in genies and growth in GDP per capita, although this weak correlation is primarily driven by China. So um, to what extent China is driving these results is something that we wanted to look at um, more carefully. And uh, so we look at Indian China. So what was happening most recently? So, um, so I didn't present the, the graph in India, but I can describe you what is in there. So uh, from, if you look at India's Gini, they have been um, increasing until 2004, and they remain constant throughout 2009. So it seems to, to us that uh, what the, the data or micro data shows is that not much is happening in terms of inequality in India. However, when we look at China, there is a, 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 a steady decline in within country uh, inequality or domestic inequality, which um, is um, reflected precisely after the financial crisis. So, um, so um, well, we were discussing these results with some Chinese colleagues, <coughs> and uh, they gave us one story, which uh, we are not sure if we buy it, but this one story. So the story is that it's related to two, um, two reasons or explanations why inequality is falling in China and therefore it is pushing down the global interpersonal equality estimates as well. So first is that um, there were some domestic policies that were introduced in the 2000s be before the crisis with the aim of uh, reducing the inequalities within the country, in particular between the, the gap between the rural and urban areas. So these policies were, for example, uh, aiming at increasing the minimum wages, extending the social protection and anti-poverty policies, in particular the, the VAU, which, as you know, was introduced in urban areas, but then expanded to rural areas in 2005. Then they start to introduce agricultural support policies because they wanted to prevent migration from the rural areas to the urban areas. And then they start to introduce some targeted tax reductions to provide incentives for people to stay and invest in those more deprived areas. But um, on top of that, which is not necessarily related to the crisis, is that the second component is that this uh, major stimulus package that the Chinese government introduced that was aimed at increasing investment, 
tax costs, uh, costs but uh, in particular increasing in social expenditure. Um, so this is one of the potential clues that may explain what is happening in China and therefore is pushing down the global interpersonal inequality that we observe. So um, I will jump the contrafactual scenarios because we are not, uh, these are just between 75 and 2005, but what uh, we, we just want to uh, uh, conclude here is that um, what we observe, nevertheless, wh whatever the trajectories of inequality we, we have seen, is that global inequality is incredibly high. So it's higher than every single country that you observe in Latin America, Swiss, and Southern Africa. So the, the global inequality is higher than the inequality that we observe within countries. So it's incredibly high. So it has been falling, <coughs> primarily because between country inequalities have been pushing down these uh, estimates. But then, as I just explained, we are observing more recently a uh, fall in within country inequality, not only in China, also in Latin America and other regions, but in China it was interesting to see this, uh, the effect because obviously our estimates are population weight, uh, population weight. So it has a, a, a lot of effects on our estimates. Um, so it seems uh, to me that domestic policies are playing a role here in explaining why global inequality is falling. And, uh, and this is something that we want to explore and we are looking forward to your views and, and comments on this potential way of explaining what we are observing. So thank you.